Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you had a fun time with the keynotes and then some good coffee break. So why are we here? We want to talk about contributing to Kubernetes in its next decade or the second decade and how Contribex has evolved from the start to where we are now and how it looks like contributing to Kubernetes in the next few years. I am Navarun. Hey everyone, my name is Priyanka Sagu. Hi, my name is Madhav and... And I'm Kaslin Fields. So today we are going to talk about like, we just want to give a rundown of how to contribute and intro on Contribex, what, we, what do we do? And then go over like what, what are the changes that has happened for making contributor experience better over the years. And then we will run through some of the hot topics that people can contribute to in SIG Contribex. And then we want to talk about some important pitfalls that contributors need to take care of when they contribute. And that's the most important part. Now, going over, how is the Kubernetes community structured? We have almost like 86,000 plus contributors at this point. We also reached like 10,000 contributors probably as the first project. So we need a lot of uh, segregation and structure to make sure the community works perfectly. So primarily we have three kinds of uh, groups, you can say, starting with special interest groups, which actually own code and take ownership of areas of Kubernetes. Sometimes they're uh, horizontal, spanning across like areas like let's say release or like SIG Contribex, which is us, and then some SIGs are vertical and focus on one specific area like uh, Node or CLI, who are more concerned with specific functionality. And then there are working groups which are formed to serve certain goals for a small period in time, and then when they achieve that, they are dissolved. Uh, key examples being reliability or structured logging or API expression. If you have seen like uh, cell expressions in CRDs, uh, those come out from such short-term working groups. And then there are committees. Uh, the committees mostly take care of like governance aspects of the project, like set the non-technical direction and make sure like everything is working fine. We have three committees, uh, the steering committee, code of conduct, and the product security committee. And there is some sort of like decision escalation path and isolation of responsibilities across these groups. Uh, so things start with like sub-projects, which are sub-areas inside special interest groups. And technical things basically boil up the ladder eventually. And then if those groups have any non-technical things to discuss or any non-technical areas that they seek guidance with, they reach out to the steering committee or if they feel like some of the project values have been violated or the code of conduct is not followed or somebody is, uh, or something is problematic, they can reach out to the code of conduct committee. Now, uh, with all this web of contributions and web of structure, how does one even start, get started? And how do they grow in the community? That needs to be important and should be, should have a set rules so that people know like what they need to do to reach a certain milestone. So people start with being a non-member contributor. So when you take up an issue or take up an area to work on, and then once you have sufficient context, you can apply for org membership, then you become a member contributor. And then once you get technical expertise in that area of code, then you can ask to be a reviewer where the primary thing is there should be a pr good provenance of reviews that ha you have done across time in that area. Now, once you have done, uh, let's say, reviews for a long period in time, and you have gained like uh, intense technical experience in that area, you can become an approver of that code base. And basically, you go beyond the levels. Now, this is the ladder that we used to follow until last year. We made a change uh, to introduce a new role called subproject lead. And this was largely done to make sure we segregate between people who do uh, technical approvals versus who do like who set technical direction 
for the specific groups. So, for example, let's say you are growing through the ladder and then you achieve to be a technical lead for a group. One good stepping stone is to be a sub-project lead, like lead a specific sub-project. To give an example, uh, 6CLI has several uh, sub-projects. One of them is like customize. So if you want to gain expertise in those areas, you start becoming a sub-project lead in one of the areas. And then that sets the tone for you to become a technical lead in the future. And the existing chairs and tails of the group will have good context on who they can ask to be uh, the next technical lead or the chair. Okay, you have now seen like what is the structure and how do people grow? But where do you get all this information at your own cadence? So the Kubernetes community repo is the repo for all contributors as the starting point for every piece of information. So you can go there by just going to a browser and typing git.kts.io slash community. Once you go there, um, you have several directories and most of them are around the specific groups which have information on those groups. Now let's see like what information is there. To start with, it's, I, I'm just focusing on our special interest group which is contributor experience. To start with, we uh, write like what does the group do and it links to the charter. It, the charter specifies what are the duties that the special interest group should do and what areas does it own. And then you might wonder like where do the people meet? So most of the groups meet very regularly, uh, maybe a bi-weekly or a weekly or a monthly meeting, depending on uh, how frequent they need to meet. Uh, especially at Secontribex, uh, we meet like uh, every alternate week on Wednesday. So if you want to join, if you want to know like what is going on, the meeting is uh, the great point. But then again, uh, the meeting time may not be very suitable for everyone to join around the globe and that is a problem that we try to really solve and uh, keep in our mind. So we record all of our meetings and the agenda is recorded really clearly. So you can go through the agenda, the meeting notes and look over the recordings to find more context. Next up, who can you contact if you want to contribute to a certain area? So the first points of contact are the chairs and the technical leads. You can reach out to them and they are listed down in each of those readmes inside the directories. And then how do you reach out to them? You can either poke them on the Kubernetes Slack by joining slack.kds.io and getting yourself uh, an automatic invite. You join the Slack and then you go to the Slack channel that is mentioned on the repo and then ask questions. If uh, Slack is not your thing, you can ask, also ask a question on the mailing list. You just need to join the mailing list and then shoot an email and then uh, anyone can respond. Now, I talked about subprojects, but what subprojects does a SIG have? Those are also listed in that very specific readme. Uh, for example, here, if you see, we have a subproject who handle and manage the community repo and then there is the community management uh, subproject, then there's a contributor com subproject where, uh, wh which handles the contributor blog, the uh, parts and pieces of the contributor website, and the tweets that go out from the KTS contributors handle. With that, I would uh, hand it over to Kaislin, who would explain more about SIG Contribux. So who here knew that the Kubernetes project had so much structure? <laughs> We've got a few hands out there. Uh, who's feeling a little lost in all of the structure of Kubernetes? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Can relate, folks. So um, basically, the technical work of Kubernetes is split up into these special interest groups and further split up into sub-projects. So as someone who is a potential individual contributor, those are the areas that you most want to look at in terms of figuring out what parts of the project interest you. So we, we didn't say it out loud, but we showed it on the screen actually. Um, myself and Nabarun are the co-chairs of the special interest group for contributor experience, which is why we're here talking to you about contribution. Um, and Priyanka and Madhu, Madhav are the, are the technical leads of the uh, special interest group for contributor experience. So what we do is we're responsible for improving the experience of folks who contribute 
to Kubernetes, which we hope will be you if it's not already. We do this by creating and maintaining programs that, and processes that promote community health and reduce project friction, while retiring programs that are not serving the community. A very important part of any project is removing things. The best uh, PRs are negative code. <laughs> Uh, so as, uh, as Navarun, I can't do this today. <laughs> as Navarun said, we have quite a few subprojects in the special interest group for contributor experience, which means that we cover a whole lot of different areas, and there's a lot of different areas that you could potentially have interest in. Um, so we have a community subproject, which is pretty general. It used to run a community meeting every month, and then that was one of those things that we got rid of because people weren't attending it, and we weren't getting uh, enough content for it. Um, but it does own and manage the overall community repo, including community group uh, documentation and operations. I am a co-lead of the subproject for contributor communications, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about later as a great place for new contributors to join in. But basically what we do is we amplify the success and uh, actions of the contributor community by doing blog posts, social media, those kinds of things. And also con communicating with uh, the contributor community directly about things that impact them, like the contributor summit. We also have contributor documentation. This is not the same as project documentation. This is specifically the documentation about how to contribute to Kubernetes. We own that. We're the people to yell at. Um, community management. Uh, so managing operations and policy for upstream community group communication platforms. So Slack moderation falls under our purview. Also dev stats. I don't know if you've heard this. I feel like it's one of the best kept secrets of Kubernetes and the CNCF at large. We have a platform where you can see statistics about how many contributions are being made to projects, where contributors, which companies, contributors, uh, companies, yeah, countries and companies, <laughs> contributors uh, are from. Um, we also run elections. So we have the steering committee, which is like the governing body of the Kubernetes project and handles a lot of the bureaucratic things that go into running an open source project. The more and more I dive into open source, the more I think it's just a business without the making money part. It's rough. Um, <laughs> but it's important to have a body that can manage kind of the bureaucratic aspects and interacting with the CNCF, um, all kinds of governance issues. We also run the Contributor Summit, which happens at every KubeCon and on the day of co-located events in this case. Um, so we run that and any other events that the contributor community wants to run, we can help to run those. Um, GitHub management. So everything that the contributor community does on GitHub, all of the processes that we use, how do you mark issues, how do you label them, um, what process do they go through to actually get uh, PR'd in and merged. All of that process, uh, determining it, follows under our purview. Also, mentoring. Of course, we want new contributors to join um, from all walks of life and of all varieties of interest and technical skill. Um, so we do our best to interact with mentoring uh, communities like the LFX mentorship, Google Summer of Code, those official channels. Um, and then, of course, at more informal levels within the project, we help with some of that as well. Um, and I mentioned earlier Slack moderation. There's also some infrastructure that goes into maintaining our ridiculously enormous Slack for our community. Um, so we own a lot of that, too. Now we're going to talk about how contribution has changed in Kubernetes' first decade. And then we're going to dive into how you as individual contributors can get started. So history first and then we're gonna tell you how to do it. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, so before we go into details on how everyone sitting here can get involved into Kubernetes, or especially in uh, contributor experience sake, let's look at some stats on how the project has changed in last decade. So this is a graph, this is a screenshot of the Kubernetes contributor growth in in last decade, starting from quarter second of 2014 till very recently, last year. And we have seen an exponential growth, which also tells us we have changed and we had to uh, undergo a lot of changes, 
have to bring in a lot of processes, programs, and everything to um, make sure we are capable of handling this awesome contributor growth. These are the actual numbers right now. This is a, uh, these are the stats that we took from dev stats um, this month itself. We are at a mark of 86.6 thousand contributors at this point of time with 4.13 million contributions. And out of all these contributors that we are talking about, we just have 6.5 thousand reviewers. So we are in a great need of reviewers. We are great need of people to grow up the ladder. So please look for the next section on how you can get involved. This is where Kubernetes in the whole CNCF ecosystem is. We are number five um, by activity. Um, so these numbers are based on our GitHub activity. Kubernetes project in the CNCF ecosystem is five by activity, number three by the authors, number two by the number of com comments we generate, number 32 by commits, 11 by issues, four by PRs, and 36 by pushes. And it's growing, it's growing rapidly. So we had to bring in a lot of changes to make sure we are able to sustainability, sustainably um, grow with this contributor growth. And these are some of the things we did in last few years. The, uh, the first one is GitHub label and process changes. So we, we talked about the SIGs, we talked about the working groups. We had to, uh, we have work happening across the project under these, I think, hundreds of SIGs and working groups and small projects um, together. And we use GitHub to manage our backlog or track our activities. And we have a whole process of uh, automation around applying labels or using those labels to fill our boards to manage our and track our activities. So we have and still improving uh, our process and how we can better keep using our GitHub labels and bring automations um, or add new labels so that we don't have to do a lot of manual churn to fill our boards. We, we can use what the processes we have and use the people to actually do the work. GitHub org membership is a big, um, thing for all of us right now. We saw the contributor um, count increasing, but that also means uh, not only we are getting new contributors every year, every month, I would say, but we also have to uh, track how many of all those contributors are active. Um, we, we have to do that for many reasons, because each contributor um, costs a lot of resources to the project. And if we don't um, use our resources properly, um, then it, it's a course. It, it, we can better utilize it. So for GitHub org membership, we have recently done a few changes. We have introduced an audit tool. Um, what we do with that is um, we had a process in place for auditing all the inactive org members. We improved the policies for that. Um, earlier, it was anybody who is an org member of Kubernetes, and by org member of Kubernetes, I mean Kubernetes org or Kubernetes SIGs, CSI, and all the GitHub organizations that Kubernetes project has. Anybody who is a member, if they are not active, let's say for 12 months, uh, they would be deemed as inactive and uh, marked for cleanup. But Every time, um, um, like in, in uh, case of Kubernetes project, GitHub is not the only place where contributors do their contribution. So it's a hard process to actually uh, mark people as inactive if they are um, doing their work outside GitHub. So this, this um, last few months, with the help of Nabarun and other people in the Contribex, we actually did our very first inactive org membership cleanup with a lot of exceptions, but we brought in a tool, um, audit tool that r uses dev stats, that takes uh, numbers from dev stats on, uh, for all the contributors of Kubernetes project, 
gives us a list of all the org members, org members who are inactive, and then we can use another tool, which is called Peribolos, to actually do our org, uh, inactive org members removal. And there is more um, updates and improvements happening right now as well. Um, we have another uh, project in place for our Kubernetes community meetings. So every, uh, like Nabarun mentioned, every SIG has their weekly meetings, weekly, bi-weekly, uh, sometime more than one meeting for a single SIG or multiple sub-projects and working group. So each of those meetings are recorded and we publish them for people who can't consume them in person or in live uh, for them to consume the recordings. So we have a Zapier uh, automation in place to um, take all the Zoom recordings and put them on YouTube. And thanks to the work of uh, Nigel and Chris Short for helping us with that. Another one is Peribolos. Um, Peribolos is our tool created by Kubernetes Project to manage our GitHub uh, configuration. So we um, use this tool to uh, manage GitHub things like org membership, our GitHub teams management, our access management, etc. And we are keep on improve. We are keeping on improving the Peribolos tool to not only do what we what I just mentioned, but um, uh, start maybe managing more of the GitHub things that we are not doing right now. So one of the things that we did recently is adding capability to Peribolos to manage repo level permissions to GitHub teams, but not just managing repo level permissions, we also added a uh, restrictions model with a default deny policy for reasons like we don't want people to just be part of a, just add, uh, we don't want people to be added to a team and then because of they are already part of a team, uh, they get escalated uh, access to repos like Kubernetes, Kubernetes, we don't want to do that. So we have a restriction model in place. The ones that we will whitelist are the only repos that people um, can add to a GitHub team, for example. On the uh, right-hand side, we have some projects which are currently work in progress or in discussion, but are on our roadmap for SIG Contribux for this year and I would say coming months itself. So mailing list migration is another one. Uh, we were using Google Groups, um, uh, I think for past years, and we are trying to move under a Kubernetes managed infrastructure. Uh, so we are working on a mailing list migration tooling for that. Slack channel reorganization is especially for the new contributors. Anybody who joins a Kubernetes Slack for the very first time, it's a very overwhelming place for somebody uh, just joining. There are thousands of channels and it's really hard to understand where to start. Even the channels we have, which are marked as Kubernetes users or Kubernetes uh, new contributors, they are also filled with questions that can make the new contributors overwhelmed. So we have put better um, or bot messages or resources in place there so that people who are just joining know what exactly they have to do next. or what are the next steps for them? We also uh, have initiatives happening around revitalizing known code contributions. This is uh, in collaboration with CNCF um, in general. Uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to develop actionable and more generalized uh, guidelines for all of CNCF projects on how to um, also advocate about non-code contributions, which are very, very important for uh, any project. For example, the contributor comms is one of the best examples we have for SIG Contribux. And finally, Google Drive and 1Password management. We, we use Google Drive for all our uh, SIG and work, working group uh, documentation, as well as uh, all our credentials for the project are managed in 1Password. But this is a huge responsibility. This is... Uh, this also needs its own policy. For example, we have a whole project for managing our GitHub operations. We are working on making such policies and um, for Google Drive and one password management as well. And moving on uh, very quickly, a lot has changed in the project in the past decade, but a lot has stayed same. What has changed is we have improved our org membership criteria, requirements, 
earlier anybody uh, with a few uh, a decide, defined number of contributions can join but right now we are fine with the same number of contributions but we encourage we really encourage you to make substantial very important contributions because the only motivation is we want people to stay in the project and to uh, work that that also uh, that is not just like a one week worth of work we want to uh, org membership is um, it's a it's an ongoing commitment but it's also uh, like a title you get. This is like one of the first contributor ladder you achieve when you get an org membership. So we really want to make it worth it. Um, contributor ladder we already discussed. And last thing, contributions and contributors across time zones. We This is an ongoing problem and will stay. So we are trying to bring in more async communication and processes so that uh, we can cater to requirements of contributors across time zones. What has stayed the same though, is getting involved in the project is still same. It's any contributor who is just starting with the project is somebody who needs to get involved, engage with the community, resolve, and stay in the project to uh, absorb what's going on. So it, that definition has not changed. It's the same thing, just that um, the processes are developing and only thing that's required is just to stay in the project and commit some time. And with that, um, I'll hand it over to Father. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go, let's move on. Um, do you want to talk about contract reforms? <laughs> hey. <laughs> So that was our overview of contribution. We promised you that you would get an overview of contribution in the last decade and how it's changing in the next decade. So that was that. Now we're gonna talk about how you get involved. So first thing, shout out to contributor comms because that is the sub project that I run and I think it's an awesome place for new contributors to join in. So here's something concrete that you could come into the project and join us to work on right now. Um, the contributor comms uh, group, like I said earlier, is all about communicating externally about the awesome work that contributors are doing and also internally with contributors about the stuff going on in the project, which you just learned a whole lot about. So one of the things that we do is an ongoing project that is basically always going to be there because we have so many special interest groups is the special interest group spotlight blog series. So in our comms group, we have a blogging leader. Shout out to Frederico. I don't know if he's in here, but sorry, Frederico, I'm giving you a lot of work. Um, <laughs> What we do is we have our new contributors pick a SIG that you're interested in, any of them that haven't been done in the last two years, <laughs> and go find the co-chairs of that special interest group and interview them about what their special interest group is about. Then you write up what you learned about that special interest group into a blog so that other people can learn about that special interest group too. Then we publish that blog on kubernetes.io, the official Kubernetes website, and usually on kates.dev, which is the developer contributor website as well. So at the end of this project, you've learned about a SIG within Kubernetes, and you have a contribution that is concrete out there in the world that anyone can see. Um, so this is a, a project that I highly recommend to anyone who wants to become a new contributor. You can find us in Slack at Sig Contribex Comms is the name of the channel. We'll have that later too, I think. Um, so reach out to us in there. Say that you're interested in doing a Spotlight blog. We meet weekly on Fridays, but won't meet this week or next week because KubeCon. Um, but get involved, say hello, say you want to do one of these, and we'll get you going. Um, I'll quickly go through the other areas that we need help with uh, in the interest of time, and we have one whole section left. Um, so we run the elections as well, and we built a tool called Electo ourselves. Um, so if you have knowledge of Python and you want to help with this, come help us. Uh, we need he your help, but if you want to run your elections, do check out the tool. It's on electo.dev, or you can come on CNC of Slack in the channel called Electo. Next up, we run this event called Kubernetes Contributor Summit at almost all KubeCons. If you have event management experience and want to um, do something for the Kubernetes community. At the same time, you are welcome to help. You can just come to the SIG Contribex channel on Kubernetes Slack and ask, how do, how do you get started? 
Um, on the automation side of things, there are two, three specific areas. One is the contributor website, which is the first stop, stop for any contributor to get some more information other than the Kubernetes community repo. If you have experience with Go and Bash, we really need your help uh, in changing the generator that we use to convert Markdown to HTML. We would really love your help there. And if you have experience with Go, uh, Priyanka talked a lot about like Peribolos and what, how Peribolos does org management. There are a couple of areas of work that you can help us with. Um, do look at the issues. Uh, once we share the slides, you can just click on the issues and come and register your interest. Now, once you, when you register your interest, do also mention like why you want to do this and some prior precedents so that it becomes more relevant for uh, someone to mentor you. With that, I'll give it to Madhav to talk about contribution pitfalls. Okay, uh, I think that was a lot of info that was just uh, thrown at you, right? So this section of the talk was essentially meant to share some of uh, the pitfalls that we faced, some of the failures that we had personally when we started contributing. One, in hopes of normalizing that these things happen, and two, in to let you know that there are very tangible ways to avoid them. And if you do face them, there's very tangible ways to get help as well. So um, one of the benefits of so much information being thrown at you isn't that you understand and absorb all of it right now. It's that you have things to go and look up once you go back. Uh, and this is just for Contrabex. There are maintainer tracks of all six that are going on today. And some of them happened yesterday as well, and some maybe tomorrow as well. Uh, so these are great opportunities to like know that these are things that you can look up and learn about and get involved in. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, these are things that we've noticed in the past couple of years and we want to share with you. The first is this thing called the good first issue trap. When you go to any open source project, one of the first things that you might look for are good first issues and they're excellent ways to get started with. They have a low bar barrier to entry. Uh, however, your experience in the Kubernetes project might not be the same as with other open source projects because a lot of the good first issues that you will come across still require you to have some of the context over there about the, any of the subparts of the project that it's meant for, right? So you might feel overwhelmed to the extent that you might not want to stick around or you might not want to work on it anymore, which is completely understandable and it comes with justifiable frustration. So when that does happen, you know, please remember that this is going to be slightly more difficult, but it's going to be that much more worth it. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Okay, uh, the next part is what I like to call embracing the entropy a little bit. Um, so Kubernetes has a lot of moving parts and picking up a task that might seem tangible can also prove to be overwhelming, as I said. Uh, there's a few reasons for it. Uh, the project as a whole has a ton of undocumented context. So there's a lot of institutional knowledge that goes into running Kubernetes, that goes into writing code for Kubernetes. And you, someone who's coming in anew, might feel like, you know, what's going on? I thought I knew what, was, what I had to do, but this is completely different. And that's understandable. Um, and typically, you, are, you might have long and multiple review cycles, right? So if you look at dev stats, the median time to merge a PR in Kubernetes is approximately two, two weeks right, uh, one and a half to two weeks. Um, and that's the time from PR open to getting an LGTM approved label on it. So these things happen and this, this takes time because we need to make sure that things that are going into Kubernetes are stable, and, but that is just the main Kubernetes project. There are probably a hundred other sub uh, hundred other repositories in Kubernetes that you can be a part of, right? Kubernetes being a great, great starting point for you. So. These are th some things that you might experience, but I just want to let you know that if you do experience them, you're doing something right, right? So let's say you, a future maintainer of our project, take up a task and you have to travel this perilous road where you need to explore multiple areas of the Kubernetes project, like let's say bar, uh, working group ABC, sub project XYZ, and then finally you explore all of these areas and then the task is complete. But you signed up for SIGFU, why do you need to go through all of these different areas to get something done? Well, that's because everything in a lot of big projects like Kubernetes is highly interconnected and you might need to do this. But there is good news. If you decide to embrace all of this chaos that comes with it, all of this unsigned up for work that you end up facing eventually, 
it becomes slightly easier because now in the future when you take up something similar, let's say you assign a task to yourself for SIGBAR, you already have some knowledge of SIGBAR from your previous thing and so on and so forth. So you're essentially caching a lot of context and caching a lot of knowledge for yourself for the future. So all of this sticking around compounds over time. Now, finally, right, finding your place in the community, there's this thing called law of two feet. So when you get started in the project, it takes time to figure out what's the best fit for you. So take your time, float around, but just keep learning, ask questions. People are there to help you out. Uh, sometimes they might not be too responsive and that's understandable because there's a million other things going on. Life happens, you have a day job, you have a family and so on and so forth. But ask informed questions after doing your requisite amount of homework. And that's the best way to stick around in the Kubernetes project. And irrespective of your skill set and your background, we could really use your help, right? Like Nabarun said, we have things that need help in Python. We have things that need help in JavaScript. If you're not a person who codes a lot and you're, if you're a person who helps plan things and develop processes for teams, we have areas in the Kubernetes project at the release team that could use your help. So whatever your background, your skill set is, we could definitely really, really use your help if you're willing to stick around, right? And please help us help you stick around. We look forward to working with you, learning from you, and welcoming you as future maintainers of our project. So please come find us afterwards. All of us are also involved with other SIGs. So if you need more information, some of the other SIGs that are, that are out there, we are happy to provide that as well. And uh, see you in the Contrabex Slack channel. Thank you.